My Lord, thank you again for another day. Allow a word that proceeds out of your mouth and from your throne room be released today to us here and to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, I have decided that today we have a formal lecture. Uh, we didn't cover this in the last uh, week, last week, but it's is even the best, I think, is the cream of everything, is the throne room. <laughs> the throne room. What is the throne room? Okay, so let's look at uh, Hebrews. Most Christians still do not know what the throne room is, or the holiest of holies in the New Testament. We know about the holiest of holies in the Old Testament in the tabernacle of Moses. We know that. But you remember that when Jesus died on the cross, that veil that separated the holiest of holies from the rest of the world was torn from top to bottom, meaning that the holiest of holies uh, is now accessible uh, to all, really, but what it does not mean that the holiest of holies became a common ground or an unholy ground. And we will look at this in more detail. But in uh, Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 describes what this throne room is. Actually, the throne room or the holiest of holies or the most holy place in the New Testament is referring to the very same thing. So let's read verse 14. <clears throat> Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. All right, let's begin. Jesus has now become the high priest of the new covenant and the throne room, or the holiest of holies. In here it tells us that this holiest of holies is the heavens. Who has gone through the heavens? Jesus, the Son of God. And so from this, we have this picture that the throne room where Jesus is now as the high priest is heaven. And then, strangely, verse 16, we are invited to approach the throne to go into the throne room. Okay, I want you to get this clear. Jesus is now ministering as the high priest in this heavenly or the real throne room, sanctuary. What Moses had was a picture, a copy, a shadow of the real throne room. And so Jesus has entered into the real throne room. And here it says heaven. But here we are invited. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. So how do we reconcile this? Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, 
Read from verse uh, chapter 9 and chapter 10, you will see more uh, explanation of this. But I have no time to go into that. But you can read it for yourself. But verse 19, chapter 10, here we go. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, that's the same as the throne room, that is the same as the holies of holies in the Old Testament, except this is the real one. The one we had in the Old Testament was just a shadow and a copy, but now we have the, whole, the real one. Where, remember, Jesus is now the high priest, And so, okay, let's read on. The most holy place, since since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way opened for us through the curtain that that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, that's Jesus, Then comes the invitation again, verse 22. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Remember, the high priest under the old covenant of the system has to go through a lot of preparation and um, cleansing and even clothing when he was going to enter into the holiest of holies. Only once a year, only one man, the high priest. And he could not enter that place without blood. And so it is, it is the same with this real holiest of holies or the, ho- the most holy place. We cannot enter without the blood. And so here, with confidence, we can enter through the blood of Jesus. So, what are we talking about here? The throne room, the most holy place, the holiest of holies. For us today, this is not talking about when we die and go to heaven. For us today, we are invited, as we are still alive, to enter into the holiest of holies. We look at this again in chapter 12 of Hebrews and verse 22 again. That language and the tense tells us that this is now, not in the past, not in the future. Okay, let's look at verse 22, chapter 12 of Hebrews. But you, that's us Christians, have come to Mount Zion... Notice the tense, have come to Mount Zion. Not not came to Mount Zion, not will come to Mount Zion. In English, have come is the perfect present tense. That means you have now come and remain and continue. That's the present perfect tense in English. But you have come to Mount Zion, so this place we call the holiest of holies, the most holy place, is called Mount Zion. There are two Mount Zion. There is one on earth, there is the heavenly Mount Zion. And this heavenly place called Mount Zion, which is the holiest of holies, the most holy place, as described in verse 22, it says, to the heavenly Jerusalem. So we're entering into the heavenly Jerusalem. And this place is also called the city of the living God. And as we come into this place, notice who is there. But we cannot see with our physical eyes. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. To the church of the firstborn. So heavenly beings and heavenly creatures are there. The church of the firstborn, most scholars have uh, decided that this refers to the people who believe in God, who died in the Old Testament, but they share in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ when he rose again from the dead. All those saints have already been risen with him. That's the common interpretation. The church of the firstborn, they're already in heaven. 
body and spirit united, which is just that Jesus, Jesus' his body and spirit have been united. Then it says about whose names are written in heaven, you have come to God. So this holiest of holies, there is God there, the judge of all men. And in this holiest of holies, you have come to spirits of righteous men made perfect. Spirits without body. Who are they? We, we can take that. These are Christians who have died since, since the Lord Jesus' resurrection, whose bodies are still on earth, um, but their spirits are already in the presence of God, in this place we're talking about. So the spirits of righteous men made perfect. And in this place, in the throne room, you have come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And then, in this place, I presume it's at the door, <laughs> and you have come to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And so the blood is at the entrance. And chapter 10 and verse 19 talks about, let us enter through the blood of Jesus. So the blood is there for us, those of us who are still alive on earth, that we can enter into this, this, this holiest of holies. So it's not a building here on earth, not a location on earth. This language tells us this is heaven. And we think of heaven as some planet out there or somewhere in space where we one day or die or you have the vision to go into heaven. That is not quite, the, that may be the meaning of heaven in some meaning of heaven, but really heaven is where God is. Where God is present, that's heaven. That's what makes heaven heaven. So if the throne room of God is here and he asks us to enter into the throne room, we are entering into heaven. Simple as that. So it is heaven, but still on earth. Angelic beings are there with God is there. He doesn't come on his own. He comes with all of the creatures and the angelic beings and you, you read that list there. They all there in the presence of God. So let's look at Revelation. This is the earth's perspective of the throne room, the holiest of holies. Let's look at heaven's perspective from heaven's angle, looking at the same throne room. Chapter 5 of Revelation and verse 11. Well, actually, chapter 5 is talking about what goes on in the throne room. Angels uh, and everyone else. So I just cut it short. Look, uh, left, uh, look at verse 11. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircled the throne. There you are, the throne. And the living creatures and the elders, in a loud voice saying, sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was, who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. That's the throne room. Heaven, creatures are there. And here is an interesting verse. Verse 13. Then I heard every creature in heaven, on earth and under the earth and on the sea, and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise, honor, glory, and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Then it gives us the picture that heavenly beings are there, but also earthly creatures. On earth, under the earth, and under the, in the sea, and in the sea. Don't ask me what those means. But the picture is clear. In the throne room, the heavenly beings, the spiritual beings, and earthly creatures, including us human beings, are there in the presence of God. God does not have two thrones. One in heaven, one on earth. God only has one throne. 
And when he sits on the throne, we come into the throne room. We join with heavenly beings in worship. And although we are not allowed to see them, and they are not allowed to communicate with us, because the focus in the throne room is on God and God alone. That's what the throne room is. And so how do I describe? When God created the world, he created the spiritual realm or the, and then the physical realm. There is a boundary. For people to cross into the spiritual realm, they have a special experience. Either a trance or a dream or uh, whatever. And for a spirit to enter into the physical, it has to manifest. Manifest in a form that human beings can know and human beings can understand, human beings can experience. Any spirit, whether it's an angel or a demon, it has to manifest to be experienced on earth in the physical realm. Whatever form and shape he manifests, that's not the question. And it's the same when a human being can communicate and enter into the spiritual realm, he has to uh, be translated into that experience. There is a boundary. But here is the interesting point. When we come to talk about the throne room, we talk about the most holy place, we talk about the holiest of holies, where Jesus is now ministering as a high priest before the Father, and we are invited to enter. We are invited to enter while we're standing here on earth in the physical. We don't have to die to go into the throne room. So what is this? The throne room, according to my definition, is where God is and where the border, the boundary between the spiritual and the physical disappear. That angels and human beings, angels and human beings are on their faces before the same God and before the same throne. That's the throne room. That's the real throne room. The Old Testament throne room or the Holy Spirit was a shadow. It was a copy. Now Jesus has entered the real one. And that's what the throne room is. And so the most important point that we, we need, I need to emphasize was what Hebrews was saying. Most of us believe and we even preach and you listen to the prayers of the saints or preachers when we pray at the opening of the service on Sunday or any other time, we always hear this. Thank you, God, that you have opened the way into the holiest of holies, that we can now come into the holiest of holies. Assume they're in the holiest of holies. While the real fact is, you do not float into the, the throne room by accident. You don't stumble into the throne room. The throne room is a state of experience where God is and where we enter into. You don't float into it. You don't find yourself by accident, accident in the throne room. It's a, it's a deliberate step to enter the throne, throne room. And you know what you're doing. And what you are, you're, you're, you're doing. So that's where Hebrews 10 is very important for us to note. We come into the throne room. And what does it say? Lays down the condition. Let us draw near to God. One, with sincere heart. Two, with full assurance of faith. You know what you're doing. You just don't float in and say, I am now in the throne room. No. The protocols of entering into the throne room. Holiness as a condition of entering into the throne room. Individually or collectively. But here it is, the process. Let us draw near to God. It's a deliberate step and you know what you're doing. It, that's why let us draw near. And so with sincere hearts, Jesus said, they that worship God must worship God in spirit and in truth. 
And it says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And Jesus said, when you want to go to offer a sacrifice to God, and you remember something is not right between you and your brother, leave your sacrifice there. Go and straighten that with your brother before you can come and take up your offering and go into the throne room. The conditions are very clear there. Since your heart. And then it says, full assurance of faith. That means through faith we can see this. Now what is full assurance of faith? Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 tells us what faith is. Faith, now faith is being sure of what you hope for. What is it that you hope for? You hope to enter into the throne room. And now with the word of God telling us when you are doing that, it's, it's a certainty of what you are, you're going to do. It's not some wishful thinking. It's not your imagination. It's a certainty. Being sure that of what you are doing and what you are going to do. And then the second thing is certain, that's the definition of faith, being certain of what we do not see. Certain of what we do not see. Well, we don't see this. We don't see the body of God. We don't see all those angels and all those creatures. But I'm certain what I'm doing. I'm certain God is there to receive me. And I'm certain that the reality of the, the scene that is described from Revelation 5 and Hebrews 12. I have no problem with that. I'm certain. It doesn't matter if I see or not. It's the throne room. But being sure of this reality... I'm certain of this even though you do not see with your physical eyes. That's the key to entering into the throne room. The full assurance of faith. And if you don't believe it, then this, you can't enter what you don't believe. You are only gazing and you are only imagining. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. Verse 6 says, in Hebrews chapter 11, it says, And without faith... It is impossible to please God. This certainty, this assurance, it is impossible to please God in every way and in many other ways. But the key is the throne room. Then it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to God, especially this throne room, must believe that he exists. And that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. There is the definition of faith and the importance of faith. So it says you cannot enter into the throne room without a full assurance of faith. Sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Then it says having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. We know about asking the blood of Jesus to cleanse us from sin, confession, before we can come into the presence of God, but we take it too generally and too lightly, and so we come and when we pray even for asking for cleansing, we say this, Lord, if you, if, if you see anything or any sin in me, ask the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse me from anything. What is anything? There is no such thing as an any sin. Sin has name. And if you know what the name is, confess it. Tell it by the name. And don't just say, ask me, to ask God to cleanse you from any, any sin. Bible even takes, tells us very specifically about to many kinds of, of sins really. The one kind of sin is sin of commission, something that you do and you do wrong. Sin of commission. That's what we call sin of commission. You commit. But there is also sin of omission. When God tells you something to do, when you know something is right that you need to do and you fail to do it, that is sin. Sin of omission. Bible says, he who knows what is right to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. That's it, sin of omission. 
But David goes beyond that. And David goes beyond and he confesses God would forgive him and cleanse him for presumptuous sin. Presumptuous sin is something you honestly believe it is right as far as you're concerned, but as far as God is concerned, it is wrong. It is sin. So ask the Lord to cleanse also from presumptuous sin. Sin of commission, sin of omission, and presumptuous sin. But David went beyond that, and he said, even ask God to cleanse me from a secret sin. Well, what is a secret sin? Well, a secret sin is secret sin. You don't know. <laughs> and only God knows if that is uh, something that you can't identify, but David made sure there is a clean slate. Sin of commission, sin of omission, presumptuous sin, and even secret sin. So coming to God is, is, is that. Psalm 24. Who is it that will ascend the mountain of the Lord? The mountain of the Lord is the same as the, the holy the, the throne room. He who have clean hands. And many other descriptions about that. He who has clean hands. These are the people who will come to the mountain of the Lord. These are the people who will enter into the holiest of holies. And so... We find here it say, cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Okay, the sins that you know and you cannot confess, it will prevent you from entering into the throne room. What about if my friend that I have offended is a long way and I cannot now, I want to enter into the throne room, but I cannot. I cannot uh, reconcile with him. Well, God is God and a commitment and a promise that the first time and the first uh, instance that I meet him, I'm going to reconcile with him. In other words, you make your commitment and a promise that you are going to put that right with your brother or your sister when you have the opportunity to meet him. A commitment like that, God will accept. God will accept a commitment like that as God will see the future and the present and the past is the same. So a commitment at that depth about any relationship that you cannot be physically do it now, God will accept. God will accept and forgive and cleanse. But make sure when you meet that brother that you do what you promised because he will hold you responsible if you lie to him. And so things like that. Then the Holy Spirit is there to remind you. So you can't rush. That's why we come and just spend time with the Lord and ask the Holy Spirit to search us. And if anything that is wrong, he will bring it to remembrance. He will show to you what you need to do about it. If, if especially when it comes to sin, he, he will show you. He won't allow you to forget if that, is, uh, if that is something that is preventing you from going into the throne room. Not only the Holy Spirit, we have conscience. He said, cleanse us from guilty conscience. God has placed a conscience in everyone. And our conscience will tell us, will remind us if something is right or wrong. And so we have this, all this, your own memory, your conscience, and then the Holy Spirit. And after the Holy Spirit has uh, I've said, check up. You uh, check your life, and you check your life with Him. Then those prayers that David prayed also come into reality, in, uh, come into play. Sin of commission, sin of omission, presumptuous sin, and secret sins. All of that, because any of those remaining in you unconfessed, there is no way you can enter the throne room. Yes, we may be in the same building. And we may say, yes, we are doing tabernacle of David. But I say, I say that the state of experience of reality of the throne room, only when you meet the conditions, you are there. You can be sitting in this, in this hall and you haven't met, the, met those conditions and everyone else are in the throne room and you're not. It's not a physical location. 
it's a state of experience where God is and all of, of creation, heavenly beings and earthly beings. And that Jesus is the high priest who is there. And that's what uh, Hebrew 4 tells us. We have a great high priest who's been through every temptation and he's sympathetic to us. It's not hard on us. Jesus is a high priest that understands us in our weakness. And he will do everything possible. The Holy Spirit will do everything possible to bring us into that. He doesn't stand at the gate with a stick to chase everybody else. He stands at the door with the blood to ready to cleanse. That's what he's standing there to do. The blood of Jesus is at the gate for all to come in. All we need to do is admit, confess, repent, and the blood is there for you to enter, regardless of age and level of maturity. The throne room is not reserved for all those great people and old people or holy people. The holiness that is required at the gate of the throne room is the blood of Jesus that cleanses you from all sin. That's the entry into the throne room. And uh, you can visit another way. The throne room is the presence of the Father. And it is the birthright of every child that it's a, it's a birthright of every child to come into the presence of the Father. And the blood of Christ is, is there for all. And so it is your birthright to come into the presence of the Father. So that's the throne room. That is the throne room. All right. Now the real subject that we've been talking about recently, are four actually. One is throne room worship. That's the tabernacle of David. We call that throne room worship. At the level of worship, we already described that in the, in another, in the last lecture on the tabernacle of David. But we have also three others that eventually we will learn and we will be able to operate in these three others. The other uh, is throne room intercession. We call this watchmen, watchmen on the wall. The way into the throne room is the same, but what activity you do in the throne room can, can be different, but I only know of four that I will share. One is worship. That's the tabernacle of David, 24-hour worship. But the second one is intercession, throne room level of intercession. I will come back to that after I mention the other two. That's throne room intercession. We call it watchmen. Watchmen and the, actually we use the word www, watchmen on the walls of the world. That's the term we use. But really, uh, it's just watchmen. Or we, sometimes we just call it the watch. The throne room watch. Throne room level of intercession. I'll come back to that. The third, and we refer to as the throne room council. Council with an S, C-O-U-N-S-E-L. The throne room council. That is where we come into the throne room to seek the counsel of God, to seek the mind of God. And we ask individual or even as a group of all leaders, come to seek the mind of God. Come to download. Not only download, we also bring uh, agenda, we also bring something that we have prayed about, we have discussed, and then we want to present it to the Lord for, uh, for his approval or confirmation or, or what he thinks about it. But we come into the throne room council to seek God's confirmation on decisions or things we have made or, uh, or what, yeah, confirming what we, have, uh, what we have decided. But better still is to seek the mind of God about 
whatever the business that we want to bring before God or the business that God would want to download to us. And that's, uh, that's, that's in a way is called the throne room council and it's more to do with downloading. In the prophecy or the prophecy of Joel and quoted by Peter in Acts 2, we read about this gift or in the end time of old men Young men seeing visions and all men dreaming dreams. It is throne room council. My modern uh, definition of dream is downloading from the throne room. All people, all men, your responsibility is to go into the throne room and download and then bring it to the, uh, the, to the young people and the young people will, who will translate dreams into visions and will translate visions into actions and eventually reality. So that's the throne room council. And sometimes you come into the throne room council not necessarily wanting to hear from God and wanting to receive from God. You come into the throne room and just spend time in his presence. Spend time in his presence, just adoring him, worshipping him. It's almost the same as uh, the, the tabernacle of David. Except that in the tabernacle of David, we don't want any business, we don't want any discussion, we don't want even, uh, even praying for the needs of the world because uh, praying has got its own platform. The platform is throne room intercession. And so the TOD, the tabernacle, is for worship. But we'll come back to throne room intercession or uh, the, what we call the watch. But let me finish. The throne room council is an opportunity to come into the same state of experience with a different purpose. The purpose of seeking the mind of God. Confirming the mind of God or the approval of God on whatever we want to bring into uh, his presence. Then the fourth area is the throne room council. C-O-U-N-C-I-L, council. Council is, in a way, it's like a board meeting, a business meeting. Or you can even say parliament meeting is council. And we will go into this. And in the future, we will find that when Jesus Christ is king on earth, the parliament of every nation is throne room council. We discuss issues, we discuss business uh, in the presence of God. And this is not only for politics, it can be for any business meeting, whether it's a, a business meeting for a business or a business meeting of the servants of God or of the church. Any committee for that matter, you will practice this Throne room council. In the Solomon Islands, we and in the Pacific, we've started to practice this. In every business meeting, whatever it is, whether it's a, a, a something out there or church or what, we simply practice this. When we come together into the presence of the Lord, uh, into the throne room, and pray of sing some choruses or waiting on Him, because we, uh, because we don't spend a lot of time worshiping because we want to get on with business. But when we come, we acknowledge that the Lord Jesus is the chairman of the meeting. And so in our business meetings, when somebody stands up to want to address an issue, he will first of all salute the Lord and say, Your Majesty, Sir, I want to speak on this subject. And I imagine that one day, in our parliament meetings, when a, somebody sta, stands up to speak on an issue, he will first of all address the Lord Jesus. Your Majesty, sir, I want to address this. I have something to say about this business, about this agenda, before you address the speaker. Mr. Speaker, sir, that is the reality of a throne room council. Even our simple people in Papua New Guinea, they've already adopted this. And when anybody stands up 
to address an issue, whether it's just a cell group, they do that already. Uh, I introduced this at uh, Timothy's place, and they practiced that immediately. I didn't explain all this I'm talking about here. But they were so sensitive that when somebody, after a message, they divide in small groups, and those ladies who are, in our language, illiterate, can't read and write their names, and they meet together to discuss an, uh, something on, to relate it to the, to, the, to the message. I didn't tell them that. But when they stood up, they salute, and they said, Your Majesty, sir, me got talk, Lodispala. I have something to say on this before she opens her mouth and talk about what it is. Once we come to realize this, man, all the business meetings and everyone that leaves our mouth will have to be calculated and will have to be appropriate in the presence of the Lord Jesus. And this is not only reserved for, for, for what is it? TOD, for watch, and for business meeting, and for parliament. In fact, we are training you people, we're training everybody that this consciousness of the presence of God with you, which is the tabernacle of God, is, is the same. What, whenever you open your mouth, you are opening your mouth in the hearing of God, and more than that, in his presence, and he's watching you. And so when this becomes the, the lifestyle of the people, the whole world will change. But this is the beginning. Let's keep moving. So these four things, throne room worship, throne room council, and throne room council. Uh, amen. It's enough for, for you to just practice it on your own. You don't really need me to watch you when you practice it. Then the fourth thing is the throne room intercession, or the watch. So the fourth thing is actually what I want to show you a little bit more so that we can go into it. This is supposed to be, we should be doing this in this session. Can I have you drink? <coughs> <coughs> All right, let's have a look at an example of what throne room council is. Isaiah chapter 62. Isaiah chapter 62. This is what throne room council is. Remember, coming into the throne room, there are no two ways. There's only one way. Laid out for us already. But the activity in the throne room gives us. But now when we are in serious business, interceding, praying for Issues, praying for nation, praying for some peoples, praying for someone, are the pattern of the throne room council. We refer to this normally as watchmen on the wall. Watchmen on the wall is actually throne room intercession. Here is a point, prayer point. And the prayer point is let's pray for Jerusalem. And that's the prayer point uh, in Isaiah chapter 62. And so let's see what, what we can learn from what the real throne room intercession is all about. Isaiah 62, let's see, says this. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet. Till her righteousness shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or name your land de desolate, but you will be called Hephzibah, and your land, Beulah. For the Lord will take delight in you, and your land will be married. And as a young man marries a maiden, so will your sons marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God 
rejoice over you. Okay, the other day we were sharing every human being, every nation, every institution, or at whatever level, God has already have a blueprint that was drawn up before the foundation of the world. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 and 4 tell us, Blessed be God who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms as he has chosen us in, in Christ before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy, that we should be blameless in his sight and that we should be to the praise of his glory. That's a summary, summary of that. In that, it tells us for every person, for every situation or place, for every nation, there is already a blueprint. And the details of that blueprint is already intact in heaven, staying there. And Psalm 139 verse 16 says something that applies to individuals but applies also to nations. And this is what it says. For all the days ordained for me were written in your book even before there was one of them. There is a diary that was written about everything before the foundation of the world. Human beings write diary at the end of the day to record what happened during the day. But God has written a diary for every one of us and for every nation before the world was created. So according to that diary and according to the blueprint in Christ, everyone can fit in there, especially a nation and so on. And there are callings and destiny of nations and people. And when all this is in record, now when we come to a date and we come to a, a situation, we come to an issue or a person that we need to pray for, the natural thing is, if we are praying for this person at this particular point of time, let's have a look at what the diary was. Let's have a look at the blueprint. I mean, if we have access to this, that would be the natural thing. Or let's take a nation that's easier. Okay, let's come to Malaysia, and now we come to pray for Malaysia. Well, the normal thing would be in the physical is a let's go and have a look at the plan. Let's have a look at the blueprint. Let's look at the diary. What is it today on this day, the 31st of October 2013? What's in the diary for Malaysia? And then when we look at the diary, we can see Malaysia is, is a long way from the diary. And so how do we pray then? The prayer makes sense then when we try, to, we try to pray according to the diary that God would bring all these things in line to what is in the diary. And that's where the, the prayer is powerful. In other words, we, we try to bring in alignment what is in heaven, earth, according to what is in heaven. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ uh, told us to pray for. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There is a diary. There is the blueprint. And we are praying that the will of God, what is being done on earth, is exactly in alignment with the diary and the blueprint. And that's, that, that's the prayer. But we go beyond that. Not only we are interested to find out what is in the diary when we pray, and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us as we pray for the situation, for the person on the ground to be in alignment with what is in heaven and what is in the diary. But God also, God himself is concerned for the situation because God designed it from the beginning. And so here is an example of Jerusalem. Although this prophecy or this passage has been written thousands of years before, it is clear that one day this prophecy is going to come to pass. And so although it's written here, it's waiting for a day, the timing of God for this to happen. So when the time gets closer and closer, 
for Jerusalem to be brought in alignment with the destiny and with the plan and the blueprint, guess who starts to worry? It's God himself. God becomes restless because this is what is designed for, this, for Jerusalem. The timing is just about around the corner. And so what happens? God in heaven, not only we have record and blueprint and all and diary up there, but God is concerned. God becomes restless. And so we see here in Isaiah, the restlessness, the burden begins in the heart of God. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her righteousness shines out like the dawn. Our salvation like a blazing torch. Until the nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand. A royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will you, they call you desolate, deserted or name your land desolate. But you will be called Hezibah and your land Beulah, for the Lord will take delight in you, and your land will be married. As a young man marries a maiden, so will your sons marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. So this prophecy and this prayer for Jerusalem is already in the heart of God. It makes God restless. The timing is coming for this to be fulfilled. And so God is like restless. He pays backward and forward because this thing will have to come to pass at the right time. But God cannot perform it. He cannot just go ahead and do it even though the plan is in heaven <coughs> and even though it's all in his heart. Even though it's all in his power to do it, he cannot. Why? Because he had committed the dominion of this world to man. In other words, God cannot do anything without man's permission. Whenever one wants to do something, he must seek man's permission. The man's authority to move his hand into action. That's the law he made. And he cannot break that law. And so how does he do it? He raises up intercessors. He raises up watchmen. He raises up people who will pray to move his hand into action. So how did he raise up these people? He passed on what is on his heart to the heart of the intercessors. And so verse 6 goes on to talk about that. I have posted watchmen on your walls of Jerusalem. These are the watchmen, these are the intercessors who have come into the throne room to perform in a throne room intercession level. And so what happened? I have posted watchmen on your walls of Jerusalem. God raises up intercessors who at that level of intercession. It's known in history and in the Bible, God never does anything on earth without, first of all, raising up prayer movements. No revival has ever come until, first of all, a prayer movement is being raised up and to pray and move the hand of God. So the rule and the principle applies throughout history and applies today and it will apply until the Lord comes back. God will not do anything without raising up a prayer movement without raising up watchmen and putting them on the walls of Jerusalem or whatever the situation is. And what happens to these watchmen? Verse 6. They will never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourself no rest and give God no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. And so what happens here is this. As the people come, intercessors come into the throne room, they come into the throne room, God passes what is on his heart, transfer that onto the heart of the intercessors. They catch what is in God's heart. 
If God is restless, they become restless. And many a time when we have this burden in our heart and we pray our hearts out as if God doesn't know. As if God is unwilling. And so we have to cry out and God do this, do this, do this. Well, you don't realize that, that what you have in your heart did not start with you. It originates in the heart of God. You only quote it from his heart. But still God says, give yourself no rest. Don't be silent day or night because God is not silent day and night. And then he loves this. You who call on the name of the Lord, give yourself no rest. And then he said, and give me no rest. (laughs) Give yourself no rest and give God no rest until he accomplishes and until he answers a prayer, until he fulfills the destiny and what has been designed for this nation, this people, or even a person. God's got all that. But he needs somebody to catch what is on his heart for that particular person and then pray it down and pray it into reality. Many times when we pray, let's use an example of a person. When we pray for a person, all we are doing is go and accuse this person before God. How dare you do that? If you can hear what is in God's heart, then you will pray in a different way. Not accusing them, but downloading the blueprint for this person from God. And if you care, God will reveal to you what's stopping this person, what is hindering this prayer. And so we pray according to the will of God. We pray according to the will of God. For the situation, for the nation, for the person. That's throne room intercession. You don't come with your preconceived idea into the throne room. You don't come with a prayer, a shopping list of prayer points. You come and download from the throne room, even the agenda, even the prayer points. But it's not wrong if you come with an agenda or you come with a burden and you come. But when you come in, find out first of all what is God on God's heart for that situation or that person. And when you find out and you see the situation from God's perspective, then you find that you yourself are are restless. And when you catch this heart disease from God, then you bombard heaven as if God didn't know. You who call on the name of the Lord, take no rest and give God no rest until this prayer point is answered. So that's the throne room intercession. The throne room intercession is downloading from God the prayer points, the blueprint, and the destiny, the calling, the gifting, whatever else is the subject matter for prayer. And so in a simple way, throne room intercession is almost like, uh, I use an example of, uh, of a photocopier. You want to come to pray for something, then find out, you know, like you put the original on the photocopier, a clean sheet of paper, you pass it through and press the button, and this clean sheet of paper goes under the, the original, and then when it comes out the other side, it's exactly like what is on the original. And if we want to pray for a situation, pray for a person, that's what we do. We come into the throne room and allow our clean heart with no hidden agenda and no impure motive, clean sheet. And as the clean sheet passes under the heart of God, what's on the heart of God for the situation, for the nation, for the person, is copied on your heart. And when you come out the other side with a copy of the original on your heart, then you bombard heaven with that. Take no rest and give God no rest until what is in this, this, this blueprint or the original is being fulfilled. That's the level of throne room intercession. We call watchmen on the house, on, on the watchmen on the walls. And so this is a model 
of what it, it means in the throne room. You can pray for Israel, pray for Jerusalem, pray for Malaysia, pray for any subject that God has laid on your heart or you want to bring to God. Go into the throne room. Download the original. And then you will pray according to that. The Holy Spirit will help you to pray in the right way, according to the will of God. Many a prayer we have prayed, and when we end up the prayer with, if it is your will. Wrong. And we think that Jesus modeled this prayer for us when he prayed, if it is your will. There is no such prayer endorsed by the scripture that if it is your will. Praying according to the scripture, you know the will of God. You download the blueprint and then you base your prayer upon the word of God. You praise your prayer on what God said. That's praying according to the will of God. And you pray until you know the will of God and then you can believe. Faith is acting upon a word from God. Faith is not imagination. Faith, faith is not wishful thinking. Faith is acting on something God reveals, something God say. And many a time we use these two phrases and we think that is a very honorable prayer. If it is your will, we think that is very good prayer. It is not. We find the will of God and then we pray down the will of God. And that's why you find the will of God in the throne room. Find the will of God. And then when you know what the will of God, then you can pray and then you can believe. Because faith is the Lord, you say this. Lord, this is what you've revealed. Therefore, this is your will. Then you can say, God, please do something about it. Or oh, if there is anything I can help or we can help, we will commit ourselves until this, this situation comes to what it should be. So that's praying according. We base this prayer, we think that's what the Lord Jesus prayed in the Garden of, Geth uh, Garden of Gethsemane. What did he, how did he pray? He didn't say, if it is your will, let this cup fast from me. He knew what the will of God was. He knew what the will of God was. It's not if it is his will. Read again. If it is possible, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. It's not if it is your will. He knew what the will of God was. But because it was so hard, he was making the final appeal. He said, God, is there another way? And he knew there was no other way. And so his prayer was uh, is, is, is more like, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. It's not if it is your will, let this cup pass from me. Wrong. He never prayed like that. And that it's all right for us to argue with the Lord, but based on his revealed will. And it's not wishful thinking and no imagination and no this prayer that we often pray, if it is your will, is wrong. It's not scriptural. There is no such prayer like that. God will never answer that kind of prayer. He will answer the prayer that you have downloaded from his heart according to the blueprint and the diary because it's already, he already is bound to do it. And when you pray according to that, he will only be pleased to do it because he cannot do it without you. He needs your permission. He needs somebody to pray it through. That's what intercession really is. Throne room intercession. And so here we have an example. Now in practical, when we come into the throne room intercession, what do you do? Well, come, enter, sing if you like, worship him if you like, say some nice things about him and exalt him if you like. Yes, do that. Whatever comes in your heart. But most of the time, watchman. Watchman has, has to be on watch. On the wall or in the, uh, in the uh, compound of uh, the presidential palace. A watchman is there fully armed. 
Not because some enemies are coming around. Even if there is no enemy to shoot, a watchman is a watchman. He is on duty. While the prime minister or the king is as fully asleep and enjoy his sleep, a watchman is a watchman. You don't have to hear messages from God. You don't have to be shooting everywhere when you watch. You can watch for days without receiving a word. You can watch for days without shooting anybody. A watchman is a watchman. That's what a watchman is. But you are fully tuned to heaven. If there is a need, alarm will come from heaven. If there is an enemy, then you spot, then you consult heaven, and then you know how to pray. And if there is a need for something in some place at some time, that will be made known to you. And then you will intercede according to the will of God. And sometimes God will even give you the prayer to pray. God will give you the prayer to pray. Almost like if God can give a prophecy that comes out from your mouth, God can also give a prayer that you will pray according to exactly what he gives in your mouth. Rema. Rema in prophecy, rema in preaching, rema in prayer. In prayer. The spoken word from the mouth of God through your mouth to address the situation. That's the word that will go out and will not return empty because it comes from the mouth of God through your mouth to a situation and miracle will happen if it needs be. That's throne room intercession. That spoken word that addresses the situation exactly as God would intend. The Holy Spirit will help. The prayer will come. God will speak that or the Lord Jesus will speak the word. And when the word comes and you say it, you state it, you announce it, what is intended for will be achieved instantly. The power of the spoken word. Let there be and there was. And in any situation, when we receive a word for a situation, let there be, there will be. The power of the spoken word is what we are moving into in this new season. The technology of this new season. And so that's intercession. And uh, if no word comes, wow, well, what is it? Boring? Snoring? It will never happen in the throne room. If you are on 24 hour yourself, uh, in your life from morning to evening, that's fine. You can go to sleep. All those things will be taken care of. But if we have a watch, and in the Solomon Islands, we just give a shift of two hours. Tabernacle of David, three hour shifts. Uh, watch, two hour shifts. And if you are not in tune, of course, because nobody is watching, we usually do it one person at a time. And uh, if you're not right, and if you're not doing it right, the next thing is nobody's there, so you can snore for two hours. And that's not a throne room. But when you are there, you can stay awake for however long. Time is immaterial. In the throne room, time is immaterial. But we're still on earth. We have to abide by programs, and, and that's not wrong. But that's the throne room. People think they go into the throne room to hear a word from God. Well, if it's the throne room council, yes. But even in a throne room council, if you're coming only to receive a word, to hear well, that's the wrong motive. It's wrong to start with. You come to just be in his presence, that's the right thing. And you can't be in his presence without him telling you anything. But when you come into as a worship, uh, like Tabernacle of David and intercession, you come. To res you, you come, and when the no word is given you, stay there. Stay there. Don't run away. Don't ask questions. You are in the presence of God. If there is something that He wants to let you know, He will let you know. He wants to use you, He will use you. And it's not wrong when you say if something comes up and you want to ask him, that's all right. This is reality. Reality. But let it be reality. The motive is, must be corrected. We are coming to God in the throne room. It's, a, it's, it's where he is. 
And so with this uh, throne room, uh, we were going to practice this. Maybe tomorrow we can practice it any other time. It's so simple. It's just like coming into the tabernacle of David. Entering the throne room, there are no two ways. There's only one way, through the blood. But whatever activity is done in the throne room, there can be many ways, more than the four I have mentioned. That's okay. That's okay, because it is life. Life is like that. Your life is not made up of four things. It's made of so many things. But the good news is, with the state of experience of the throne room, when it is your desire, you can carry it around with you. 24 hours a day. And not limited to a tabernacle of David or a house. That's really where I want to be. For me, 24 hour worship or intercession, I do it 24 hours a day. That doesn't mean I am awake all day. I have to eat, I have to swim, I have to wash, I have to do other things. But the state of connection with God remains. It can remain with you. Actually, that's a new message downloaded in the East Coast of America during the last prayer assembly. Wow, the message is, is, is so powerful. I've just finished the report. I finished just the bare minimum of the message that was downloaded in the East Coast of America uh, to Milo, and he will circulate that around the family. But that's just the beginning. There is more to come. And the download from the throne room, if you think what I've been talking about is new, just hang on. There's more coming. More coming and greater. So let's be ready. But let's be quick to learn what is already available. Let's be quick to do what is already here. Because very soon this will be out of date. There is new download coming for this end time move of God. New technologies will be made available in the end time for the end time ministry. So, that's it. The throne room. And then, uh, what we've been doing here is evenings, not only those times uh, we, we, we stayed, we will do it, but it's, an, it's a 24-hour uh, activity, actually. But that's okay. When we want to do it in a group, we must uh, set times for it when we can come together. But I want to let you know that on an individual level, you can be doing TOD 24 hours a day yourself. Because this is, this is what it is all about when we talk about the tabernacle of God. God in the midst of his people. And may I finish with this message. May I finish with this, this message. In the past or up until now, we have been trying to find our way into the throne room. We have been climbing the mountains to reach the throne of God. Now, God is coming out, out from the, 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 his throne room and he's coming down the mountain. It's, he's heading for your home. He's heading to your home now. So that your throne home can become the throne room. And your home can become the mountain. Where God is. And where you live it. And as the word of God says. As we do in the general presence of God. In him we live, we move and have our being. In the manifest presence of God. With all the conditions attached. We can even reach that level. That in this manifest presence of God, in the glory of the Lord, within the Shekinah glory, we can say, in him we live, we move, and have our being. But, with the manifest presence of God, conditions are attached. With the general presence of the Lord, everything is already there. Whole creation, stone, living things, and wicked and the, and, and the righteous are in the presence of God, the general presence of God. For in him we live, we move our heaven being refers to everything. 
the righteous and the wicked. God let his sun shine on the righteous and on the wicked. We benefit out of the, the blessings of the general presence of God. But I'm not talking about the general presence of God here. I'm talking about the manifest presence of God. The Shekinah glory. And so this is, the door is now open for us. You know, when the Lord Jesus died on the cross, the door was open to go into the throne room. That's what we've been talking about. But now in this season, the door is now open for the Lord to come into your home, into your room, bringing his throne room with him. That's the name of the game. If you can let him, he'll come, welcome him into your room, into your home, into your business, into your activity. And he will come in. And when he comes in, he brings his throne room with him. For God cannot separate himself from his throne room. Wherever he goes, his manifest presence is his throne room. Heaven accompanies him. All the blessings come with him. He doesn't come and just, you wouldn't know. He comes with his glory and whatever is included in his glory. So it's now made available to the world, made available to individuals, even you. It's there for you, for your taking. So may God bless you to receive and respond to the message of the hour that is now available at your doorstep. In Jesus' name, amen.